In this video, I'll provide a short overview of the theory and application of a variation of ANOVA referred to as analysis of covariance or ANCOVA. We'll first discuss the problem that we're very often faced with in, ex with in experimental research that ANCOVA can help us solve. So let's say we have type of diet as our independent variable, and we want to determine if different types of diets can produce different levels of weight loss. So in other words, we want to determine if type of diet has a cause and effect relationship with weight loss. The assumption then is that the type of diet and only the type of diet will directly affect the amount of weight loss that's present. But we know in many cases with human subjects, especially in experimental research, there might be other outside factors that could affect the level of weight loss above and beyond the type of diet the person is, is undergoing or the type of treatment they're receiving. So in this example, there are other factors that could help explain weight loss. And there are numerous, and these are just a few examples. So sex, age, exercise level, the amount their weight to start with, uh, the amount of body fat percentage they start with, um, how well they adhere to the diet. Perhaps the groups, um, as they are determined, were non equivalent to start with. So maybe one group is heavier than the other groups, and so they have more potential weight loss. Uh, perhaps there's a testing effect present. Maybe their weight loss may change just because of the testing process. Um, and that might not be the case in, in this example, but there are other examples in which the post-testing could be different just because uh, they've learned from the pre-test, and so that could then affect the outcome. And so these kinds of variables, uh, what we refer to typically as confounding variables, could have an impact on how well we can determine the effect of type of diet. And so these become problematic. They become threats to the internal validity of the study. So how can we deal with these confounding variables? How can we diminish the effect that they're having on our ability to see the cause and effect relationship? Well, there's two ways we typically try and deal with these. The first is we try and control them in the design. So we try and do things in the design of the study that helps eliminate or at least controls the effect that sex or age or exercise level may have on the outcome. So we may make sure that we have an even distribution of sex and ages, or we might limit it to one sex or one age group. We might make sure we uh, have consistent le exercise levels among all participants, or perhaps we just don't let them exercise at all. So there's different ways we can control those sorts of things in the design. Now, if we can't control those things in the design, or maybe we didn't uh, foresee that these variables might be a factor, so we weren't able to incorporate them incorporate them in the design, then our second alternative is to control these effects in the analysis. And that's where the analysis of covariance comes in. This allows us to control the influence of these variables um, in the analysis portion. And that then is the utility of ANCOVA. So let's talk a little bit about, about the formula of ANCOVA. It is an extension of ANOVA. It is a, it is a a special case of ANOVA. So we're still using the idea that we've got an independent variable and we want to study its effect on a single numeric outcome or dependent variable. So that idea is, is much the same. And again, we can use three or more groups um, in which to look for differences in that single numeric outcome. So as I mentioned before, we can use this analysis to account for variables that have a known effect or we presume might have an effect on the dependent variable, but they are not actually independent variables in the study design. So these are things that could have their own cause and effect relationship with the outcome or could interfere with the cause and effect relationship we're trying to, to look at. So these variables are referred to uh, typically as covariates. In other words, they provide additional variation in the subject response that we want to try and control. So that's why we call them covariates. You'll often ref hear them referred to as intervening or confounding variables. And those are all synonyms for each other. So what the, uh, the analysis will do is it will control for the effect the covariates have. And then it basically takes out the effect that these variables might have on the outcome. And then the analysis mirrors a standard ANOVA. 
get, we get F ratios, we're still able to interpret the effect of one or more independent variables on a dependent variable. And so we can still study the main effects of the different factors that we might have in place. We can also look at the interactions between factors if we're talking about a factorial uh, ANCOVA. And again, these, these effects are assessed after the effect of the covariate has been removed or eliminated. So why is this important to us? Why do we want to use an ANCOVA versus just accepting the fact that there might be a covariate and doing a regular ANOVA? Well, the ANCOVA helps us increase the sensitivity of the F test. Because we're removing that predictable variance from the covariate from the error term, that actually makes the error term smaller. And as you remember from the ANOVA formula, when we have a large numerator uh, and a small denominator, which is what the error term is, we have a likelihood of getting a large F score, and then we're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. When we have covariates, that error term becomes larger than we want it to be. And then we end up with a smaller F score and therefore less likely to have to accept the null. So if we can remove that effect of the covariate, covariate from the error term, that error term becomes smaller. And that improves then the power of the analysis. In other words, our ability to see a statistically significant difference. So that's really where the ANCOVA can become useful for us. We can take out some of that additional noise and have a better way to, to see the signal, to see the effect of the actual treatment or the actual effect of the treatment. So how this formula works without going into too much detail is basically the group means are adjusted based upon how much effect the covariate actually has. And so the formula does kind of a mini regression equation and figures out how much variance is explained in the outcome by the covariate variable that we might have. And then it can actually give a quantitative value to say this covariate is either increasing or decreasing the outcome variable by this amount, 5 points or 10 points. And then the group mean is then adjusted by that 5 point or 10 point amount that the covariate actually has. So the formula looks at the relationship between the covariate and the outcome, then predicts how much variance it has with the outcome, an actual value, numeric value, and then it removes that numeric value from the group means. And so now those group means are adjusted based upon the effect the covariate is having. And so when we get into SPSS and we actually will look at the outputs, you'll see the group means will be designated as the adjusted group means after the ANCOVA. In other words, these group means have been changed by a certain amount, and that amount is the effect that the covariate is actually having on the outcome. So that, that is how it works in essence, how the formula works in essence in order to help us control that variance. So let me give you kind of a graphical representation of how this formula works. So as we look at this first uh, pie chart, we can see that the circle represents all of the variance in an ANOVA calculation. And so the blue is the variance due to the treatment. That's the mean square between the numerator of that F formula. And then the red and the orange represents the error variance. In other words, the, the denominator um, of the F formula, the mean square within. Now in this case, the mean square within, the error variance, has two components. It has the true error variance, the within cell variance, the mean square within, but it also has, in orange, the variance due to a covariate. So these two things combine then to create the mean square within, the amount of error that's present. So as we look at this pie chart, we can see that if we were to actually put numeric quantities to these, these pie chart uh, sections, the blue and then the red and orange together are almost equivalent. So that means the mean square between value will be almost equivalent to the mean square within. So that ends up giving us an F score close to 1. And so when we have an F score close to 1, as you remember, we're going to most likely accept that null hypothesis and say there is no difference, there's no effect of the treatment because we have a large amount of error and also a large amount of variance due to the treatment. So they kind of cancel each other out. 
So we end up accepting the null hypothesis when in reality we maybe should not have. So we end up making a type 2 hypothesis testing error. Maybe there really is a true treatment effect in the population, but we missed it because the covariate is inflating the error variance and then giving us an F-score close to 1. So what the ANCOVA allows us to do, it basically removes that orange portion of the error variance and now the air variance shrinks. So now the red and orange no longer is the air variance, now it's just the red. It's the true within cell or within uh, air variance. And so that basically makes the variance due to the treatment become larger. So we can see we have a much larger blue chunk or blue portion of the pie chart now. So now we have a fairly large mean square between score and a much smaller mean square within score. So now, because we have a large mean square between and a small mean square within, we're going to have a large F score. And we're going to be more likely able to uh, reject that null hypothesis. So now the true treatment effect becomes more apparent, and we're less likely to make that type 2 hypothesis error. We're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis that is probably true. So hopefully that helps kind of explain how the formula actually works when we think about this in terms of, of the amount of variance, whether it's due to the treatment or due to error. And if we can shrink that error variance, then we're more likely to see the true effect of the treatment, have a large F score, and then be able to reject the null hypothesis. So the next thing we have to talk about is how do we choose our covariates? And so what we've got to think about as part of our design is what are some potential variables that could affect or have the potential to affect the dependent variable? Using our, our weight loss example, just using kind of common sense and using our, our clinical judgment, we can come up with a pretty good list of things that might affect the dependent variable. And then we've got to decide, you know, do we need to control these in the uh, design or we control them in the analysis? And so very often, as I mentioned before, we can't necessarily control them in the design or we might not have foreseen that they were going to be a, a problem and then we've got to adjust for them in the analysis. So there's a pretty, some pretty common variables that tend to have a potential to affect the dependent variable and become potentially covariates. One is demographic information like age, the place you live, um, height, weight. Um, basically, we can think of inherent characteristics that people might have. These could potentially become covariates. Um, other things that could be covariates are differences in the groups due to sampling. So if one treatment group has a very different kind of sample makeup compared to another group, in other words, more males compared to the other group, or maybe an older, uh, uh, older age or a younger age compared to another group, these differences due to, to convenient sampling, typically, or non-random sampling, could become a potential covariate. Going back to our weight loss example, if we have one group has a body fat percentage to start with that's close to, to 30 or 40 percent, and another group has a body fat percentage starting out close to 20 percent, there could be a, a very big difference in how they respond to the treatment. So these differences due to group characteristics, um, due to sampling, could have a big impact. Another variable that I mentioned before is the testing. If we're doing a pretest and a post-test, the pretest by itself could be um, a covariate as well because if there's a learning effect from pretest to post-test, the pretest becomes now a source of additional error variance. And so we can try and account for that. So the number of covariates we're going to use depends on a few things. First of all, we typically will, will look at previous research to see if other researchers have identified potential covariates. And then if we know that those covariates are out there and we're doing something similar to, to what's been done before, then we want to make sure that we're incorporating those in our design or our analysis. Typically, as the number of independent variable levels or the number of groups increases and the total number of subjects increases, that actually introduces the possibility for more covariates to be present. So the more complex the design is, whether by the number of groups or the number of subjects, the more potential there are for these covariates to sneak in 
and have an effect on our outcomes. Now that might seem a little counterintuitive because we always talk about the bigger the sample size, the better. But if we think about this, we think about the greater number of people we have involved, the potential for problems will naturally increase. And a good analogy I like to use is if, if you're having a discussion with two people, that's a little easier to control than when you're having, trying to have a discussion with 100 people. With 100 people, now you've got all these different viewpoints coming into play, and being able to control and understand that kind of conversation becomes very difficult. But if you're having a conversation with just two people, you have a smaller number of viewpoints, and so that's a little easier to control for uh, these differing viewpoints. So it becomes a little easier to see what's really happening. So that's again kind of a trade-off. We, we'd love to have larger sample sizes but we also have to be prepared for the fact that we could have a greater number of covariates compared to a smaller sample size. So those are some things we have to take into consideration when we think about choosing our covariates. Now there are some assumptions and limitations to ANCOVA um, and the first is there actually has to be a relationship, a numeric correlational relationship between the dependent variable and a covariate. That's one of the kind of screening things that we do at the very beginning of an ANCOVA is to make sure this covariate really is a covariate. So if it has a linear uh, numeric relationship with the outcome, then it potentially has an influence on that outcome. And so we can treat it as a covariate. The covariate has to be have a stable or equivalent variance in each group. So the covariate has to have the same influence on one group that it might have on another group. And another kind of assumption here that I, that I haven't mentioned but seems somewhat obvious is we have to have measured the covariate. So if we think something like age might be a covariate but we haven't measured it for our subjects then we can't control for it in the analysis. So obviously a covariate has to be something that we have measured or are able to measure. And the next is the covariate has has to be measured without error. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a valid, reliable measure um, of whatever we think the covariate might be. So if we think, for example, uh, age might be a covariate, but we, we haven't actually measured that directly and we're just estimating that then that, that could introduce some additional error and that kind of defeats the purpose of measuring the covariate if we measure it with, with error. The assumption is samples should be randomly assigned. Uh, if they are not, then we have to be watch very closely to make sure that the pretest is not a covariate. In other words, we don't have equivalent groups. The outcome score distributions should be normal or approximate normal and again that's it's something we can look at as part of our normal screening process. And then just like in t-test and ANOVAs, we want the group variances to be similar to each other. We don't want one group to have a much larger standard deviation compared to another. So we again want to check that as part of our, our initial data screening and that's something we can do typically using Levine's test, similar to what we had done in uh, t-testing in an ANOVA, in our standard ANOVA. So those are some of the kind of the the conditions that need to be present in order for us to be able to accurately use ANCOVA to test a hypothesis. So hopefully you were able to get a good sense of how ANCOVA works and how we can use it um, in a experimental testing situation. And if you've got questions, please make sure you post them in the forum.